Great. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, today we have Dr. Lisa Fair, um, and she is going to talk to us about neuroscience in space, uh, which is going to be super cool. Um, this is also our last meeting of the year. Um, we're going to probably come back to you in either January or February of 2023, which is wild. And um, yeah, we're very excited to cap off this, this incredible year. We've had a lot of wonderful speakers and it's been so good to see you throughout. All right, so in case this is your first time coming, we're Women in Aerospace Medicine. Um, we're a subgroup of AMSRO, um, which is the Aerospace Medicine Student and Resident Organization. And we are here to create opportunities for leadership, engagement, mutual support, and um, really provide a space for women and female identifying people um, in the aerospace community to get the support they need and reach their professional goals. Um, and what we've been doing is we've been having meetings where we, we um, talk to each other. We have people from all around the world and actually whoever's um, in here, if you guys wanna just drop where you're at today um, in the chat, I'd, we'd love to see where you guys are coming to us from. Um, and you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We're always at Women in Aerospace Med. Um, so yeah, feel free to pass that along to your friends. And we love growing and building our community. Um, so some quick shout outs um, to some of our members. We have Dr. Samantha Moore and Anna Jerga, who um, got, the NASA, got into the NASA Shine program. Um, so that's super exciting. You're gonna have to tell us how that goes. Um, and um, they're doing virtual space radiation um, in 2023. And hopefully if you applied and didn't get it, we're, there's another call in six months. So look out for that and keep trying. Um, it just takes some persistence. Um, and Shauna, I don't know if Shauna's on right now, um, but she wanted us to share. Um, there's a lot of wonderful resources for space medicine and for um, wilderness and emergency medicine. So what we're going to do is we're going to put these up on our website so you don't have to like um, screenshot this in your brain and these are all links, but we're going to link this. Um, maybe we could even link some of these in our, the YouTube um, video as well. And we'll put these on our website so that you can be sure to find um, there's so many great courses and um, resources or places where you can look for um, opportunities represented in these links. So thank you so much, Shauna, for, for sharing this. Um, and another exciting update is just a few days ago on Sunday, Artemis splashed down um, with a successful mission. So that's really cool. And we're super looking forward to seeing more um, from Artemis in the very near future. Um, yay, go Artemis. All right, and then with that, I would love to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Lisa Fair. Um, so she is a reader, which means uh, like a lecturer, um, if I'm not wrong, um, in cognitive neuroscience at Burbeck University of London. Um, so she's in England, as am I. Um, she completed a BSc and MSc in psychology at um, the Università degli Studi di Pavia, which I'm so sorry, I probably mispronounced, in Italy, um, where she also obtained a PhD in psychology in 2012 for investigating multisensory integration between vestibular, somatosensory, and visual function in humans. Um, she was a postdoc fellow at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at U um, UCL, and she took up a faculty position at the Royal Holloway University of London um, and joined Burbeck University in September of 2021 and has established the Vestibular Neuroscience Laboratory, which hopefully we're gonna hear a bit about today. Um, and her research, which again, I'm super excited to get into, um, combines cognitive neuroscience, neuroimaging, vestibular physiology, and space science methods, and helps us understand how gravity shapes behavior on Earth and how altered gravities might impact cognition and performance during spaceflight. Um, so her work is supported by national and international project grants, um, including the British, the UK British Academy, UK Royal Society, uh, Japanese National Institute of Information and Communications Technology, um, the Bial Foundation, European Low Gravity Research Association, and the uh, European Space Agency. So that is so cool um, that you have all of these organizations um, pooling into your research. So with that, um, I would love to turn it over to Dr. Fair um, 
yes, we're very, very excited to hear about um, all of that. So I'm going to stop my share. And thank you very much, to... Rolle. Thank you very much, Rolle. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK, good. Let me see whether I can share my screen. Um, hopefully, yes. Um, Wonderful, yep. Can you see my screen as presentation? Yes, perfect. OK, so before that we get started, I just want to say well done for the Italian pronunciation. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that, but thank you. And yeah, thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's a real pleasure to tell you about my research that is focusing on our brain in space and in particular, what are the effects of altered gravity on human cognition and behavior. We are clearly at the beginning of a new space era and space travel has become a long, long, long way since the very beginning. Many things have been changing since when we had the first animal in space and then immediately after the first human in space. We managed to achieve to have people, men on the lunar surface during the Apollo missions. And we then established an environment, a human habitat, that is orbiting around our planet, the ISS. So not only people were going in space for a short amount of time, but they were managed to stay in space for many days, for many months. And here you can see a couple of records from astronauts have been in space for more than 350 uh, days. However, we are right now at the, at the beginning of a new era for space exploration. There are new venues for space exploration that will allow us not completely trained people to go to space. And this is the so-called space students that we are uh, observing in these days, as well as having deep space mission back to the moon and to Mars. It's absolutely exciting. And we have, however, to remember that space is a extremely hostile environment. It's an extremely hostile environment and probably the ultimate frontier for the human ability to adapt to the external environment. Why? Well, because there are many different stressors that affect the human physiology in space. There are some physical stressors that include the presence of radiation, the presence of extreme temperature, the lack of atmospheric pressure, as well as microgravity. But there are also other stressors that are going to directly influence uh, human well being and physiology. There are not going to be the usual circadian rift, meaning that the cycle between day and sleep is going to be altered. And we know that we really need to have this day sleep cycle in order to rebalance our organisms, in order to have the right amount of hormones and neurotransmitter, and also for our brain to rest. There is going to be isolation, confinement, living in a small restricted environment. There's going to be stress, and here I'm talking about physiological stress as well as psychological stress. Being in an extreme environment is stressful. It's stressful at the, for our body, it's stressful for our brain. And the duration of deep space mission is going to be much more than the duration that we are used so far. So taking together all these stressors seems to indicate that the challenge that we are going to face for deep space mission, although absolutely fascinating, is going to be a real big challenge for the human health. And we need to consider all these factors in order to ensure a good a performance and survival of uh, people exploring space. I'm particularly interested in microgravity and how alteration of um, gravity might influence how the, our brain responds. And I think that understanding the brain responses to altered gravity is actually essential in order to ensure the success and safe outcome of space missions. So let's talk for a second about gravity. What is gravity? Well, it's very difficult to describe what is gravity. And I absolutely love this quote from Albert Einstein, who say that gravity is the first thing which you don't think. So let's focus on that for a second. Um, we cannot really perceive gravity. We cannot see it, we cannot touch it, we cannot smell it. It's 
are sensory information that is provided by our environment, which doesn't really have the feature of other sensory informations. What do I mean? Well, we can see lights, we can see color, we can hear sounds, we can uh, detect a mosquito on our skin, but we cannot really perceive, sense, gravity in the way in which we perceive many other environmental feature. However, gravity is an environmental feature. Gravity is a feature of our planet, is the attraction that our planet is exerting in all the objects, including our own body. Gravity on Earth is 9.8 meter by second square, which corresponds to 1G. It's a linear acceleration and is not such a small linear acceleration. Nevertheless, we are exceptionally adaptive to terrestrial gravity. And I'm wondering whether you might be able to do this exercise with me right now. So can I ask you to lift your arm in this way? Can you do it? Hopefully, yes. Now, if you're doing this exercise, you can do it in a rather easy way if you might want to do it for just a couple of times. Of course, if you're going to do it for thousands of time is going to be a completely different story. We are not going to talk about that. But if you now want to voluntarily lift your arm, you can do that almost without any effort. Now, this is amazing in my opinion, because what our brain is doing is actually sending muscular information, uh, motor information to our muscles in order to counteract the 1G acceleration that is affected on our arm. And this allowed us to move without almost any effort and interact with this 1G um, gravitational environment. In other words, every time that you are drinking your coffee by lifting the cup, your brain is uh, knowing that there is 1G in our environment and is controlling our arm in order to produce a movement that can successfully interact with the cup of coffee. And being Italian, this is absolutely essential in my daily life. Anyway, so we are exceptionally adapted to terrestrial gravity. We can detect whether acceleration of objects are according to gravitational acceleration or not. We are also very good in spotting whether objects are not aligned with the direction of gravity. Now, on our planet, the direction of gravity is vertical. So it's perpendicular to the floor. And we are very good in detecting objects that are not aligned with verticality. And when I say very good, it means that we can spot uh, objects that are off of the vertical with 2.5 degree uh, tilt, which is very, very small. So we can detect very easily acceleration that are against gravity. We can also detect whether objects are or are not align with the direction of gravitational orientation. And we can use this information in order to interact constantly with objects. Now let's think about catching a ball. And here I'm going to show you an amazing catching that has been performed a couple of years ago. So she managed to catch a ball in a fantastic way. Now, maybe we don't have her skills. This is pretty obsessional, but we are still quite good in catching an object if someone throws us an object. And every time that we are doing that, we need to take into account the fact that in our planet, there is 1G acceleration and coordinate our body, our muscle in order to, to do that. And this is not trivial. It's actually a task that our brain perform almost without effort, but it's not a trivial task. And it has been shown, for instance, that when you ask people to catch an object, there is muscular activation before that they properly initiate the movement in a sort of a preparatory state for the movement itself, suggesting that our system is definitely taking into account the amount of gravity, the trajectory that the object is going to, to, to do because of the presence of gravity, and get prepared in order to interact with that object. But how does our brain know about gravity? Well, we don't have a gravity specific receptor that allowed us to detect gravity, but we believe that the vestibular system is essential in providing to the brain information about gravity. And that's not only because I'm a vestibular neuroscientist, we believe that there is a physiological reason for that. 
So here you can see the uh, vestibular system in the inner ear. So we are zooming in into the inner ear and deeper inside the temporal bone, we have this amazing sophisticated structure, which is the vestibular organ. Now the vestibular organ detect each movement of our head in space and translate the movement in terms of angular and linear acceleration. So every time that you move your head in this way or in this way, every movement of your head is immediately detected by the vestibular organ and the vestibular organ are then going to signal to the brain, where is your head in the 3D space? Now, I said that the vestibular system is encoding, is representing linear acceleration and gravity is indeed a linear acceleration. So the vestibular system is providing to the brain information about where is our head in function of linear acceleration of gravity. Now, if your head is upright, and if we zoom in into your vestibular organ, we can see a structure that is this one here on the side of my slide. So we have inside the vestibular system, the otolith organ, which look like tiny, tiny small stones, which are perfectly unbalanced on a fluid. Now, this fluid is full of air cell that you can see here in the diagram. And if your head is upright, gravity is perpendicular to the position of the otolith organ. In other words, gravity is vertical and the otolith organs are horizontal on this fluid and they are perfectly unbalanced. But now let's do a movement with our head. Let's tilt our head towards the back. The situation inside the vestibular organ is completely different. Because of the presence of gravity on our planet, the fluid start to shift, the otolith organs start to shift, and this is going to move the air cell that are embedded in this structure. Now, the movement of the air cell is going to trigger an action potential, which is a neural signal that is then transmitted directly to our brain. And this is how our brain knows from the vestibular organ that our head is not longer aligned with the direction of gravitational uh, information. Isn't that fantastic? I think that this is absolutely beautiful. Anyway, our brain is taking into account constantly information from the vestibular signal, and it combines information from the vestibular signal with information from our eye. As I mentioned earlier in my talk, we are very, very good in detecting whether an object is aligned or not with um, gravitational orientation. So think about when you have a frame on your wall and you immediately spot it is not really vertical. That's because you can get information from your vision about what is vertical or not. So the brain takes into account information from the vestibular system, from vision, as well as proprioception. So those are uh, receptors that are inside our muscles and our tendons and allowed us to know exactly where we are in space in terms of where are our body parts in space. So this is also important in order to tell us where is the body posture in function of gravity. And last but not least, the brain also take into account information from the visceral organ that can inform about the direction of gravity. And in particular, where is our body in function of the direction of gravity. Now we have vestibular, visual, proprioceptive, and visceral information. They are going to be combined, integrated all together in order to provide an internal model of terrestrial gravity. And this internal model of terrestrial gravity, which is absolutely shaped on the amount of gravity on our planet is perfect for our interaction with external environment, is optimal for interacting with objects, is optimal for lifting this cup of coffee in a successful way every time that I'm doing that. But clearly, if we have a model that is optimal for terrestrial gravity, it might be possible that this model is not optimal for other type of gravitational environment. So once that we are going to be back on the moon, then we are going to face a completely different amount of gravity, which means that all our experience, our prior knowledge about the internal model of gravity are not really going to work with a um, lunar gravitational environment, which is much less than the terrestrial one. So the gravity on the moon is 1.6 meter by second square, which corresponds to 0.16 G, which is, way less than our usual 1G environment. So is it possible to adapt our internal model of gravity 
to a different gravitational environment. And this is how um, the focus of my research and the quick answer, if you just want to leave the talk, is that yes, it's potentially possible, but it requires effort and resources for our brain. But I hope that you are not actually leaving. Okay, so since the first space mission, uh, it was clear that being in an altered gravity environment can change the body physiology. Let's see that some astronauts even reported the fact that being in outer space for um, a period of time looks like a very, very fast aging uh, process. And that's quite a good description about what are the effects of altered gravity on bodily physiology. Altered gravity can change many different physiological systems. It has been shown that the lack of gravity can induce a shift in the bodily fluids from the legs to the head. And this shift has been estimated to be around two liters. So it's quite a consistent shift of fluid. Because gravity is not longer there, our muscles do not really need to counteract gravity anymore. So they start to shrink and they start to absorb extra tissue for the lack of the use. Uh, it has also been shown that bone density is going to decrease and the fluids that are shifting toward the head to the upper part of our body are probably going to compress the structure in our head, including the brain and the visual nerve. And indeed, it has been reported that astronauts might, um, might have a blurred vision because of the pressure that is going to compress the optic nerve. A little bit more into details, here you can see the effect of the lack of hydrostatic pressure during space flight. You have here a schematic of pre-flight, microgravity exposure, and post-flight distribution of fluids in the three different uh, conditions. And you can see here in a color-coded um, gray scale how the fluids shift from the legs when, they, when we are in a terrestrial gravity environment to a shift towards the upper part of the torso and the head when we are in microgravity environment. And of course, when people are back on Earth, the shift is going to be again towards the, um, the leg. Now, this shift of fluid is important for many different reasons, including the fact that the cardiorespiratory system needs to adjust to the shift of fluid, but also all these fluids that are going up towards the head, they are essentially going up towards the brain, which is something interesting for us uh, neuroscientists. There is um, a reduced density in, in the bone. So here you can see bone structure before and after space flight. And you can see that there is a reduction that can um, in bone density that can reach about 15%, which is not small. And another example is the presence of back pain. The lack of gravity on our spine um, allowed to have more space in between the vertebra. Now, this means that people are getting a little bit taller. And if you are quite short as myself, it might look great, but actually uh, having more space between the vertebra seems to be uh, correlated to the presence of back pain, requiring that astronauts need to wear or have countermeasure in order to prevent this effect on the spine. So there are many different changes in body physiology, but what about the brain? Now, surprising, the brain has been neglected for many years and people were mainly focused on uh, cardiorespiratory and muscles and bone density, rather than directly looking at what are the changes in the human brain and behavior. But we know from astronauts report that actually there are structural and functional changes induced by microgravity on the brain. There are changes that are structural and one of the most interesting example is the reduced connectivity in vestibular area. So now what we are looking at here is a slice of the brain in a MRI image is like that we have cut the brain and removed the top part. So we have an horizontal view of our brain and we can then identify that there is less connectivity in one of the key vestibular area, which is the one highlighted in blue. So this area in blue 
it's called insula and in particular it's the insular cortex in the right hemisphere and is one of the key area for vestibular processing now normally different brain areas are communicating to each other, they are connected to each other, and these ensure the well-being of our brain. These ensure that we can have successful behavior. Now, it has been shown that after 100 days in space, there was a selectively reduced connectivity in this brain area, uh, the right insular cortex, meaning that these key vestibular areas is kind of stop talking with other brain areas, which is a little bit scary. Another structural change that has been recently identified is an increase in the size of the ventricle. Now, do you remember that I mentioned that the fluids are going up towards the head, and this is going to compress some of the brain structure as well as shift in the brain towards the skull. It has also been shown that the ventricles, which are this structure here, that I hope that you can see with my pointer, um, seems to increase in size because of the amount of fluid that are going to uh, be present in the head. Now, these also induce the fact that the superficial cortical area, pretty much here and here and here, are going to be compressed and reshaped because of the pressure that is present in our head. So we have on one side reduced connectivity between vestibular key areas and other brain areas, as well as other uh, brain structural changes, such as an increased size of the ventricle and a compression of some of the key cortical areas. Now, when we talk about changes in brain structure, very often we need to expect changes in behavior, in the functionality of our brain. And since the first space mission has been clear that there are these changes in behavior, up to 80% of astronauts report space adaptation syndrome or space motion sickness in the first hours, days, and weeks uh, when in, they are in microgravity. So as soon as they are exposed to microgravity, they seem to have a very strong motion sickness. Now think about the motion sickness that you might have when you are on a bus or when you are on a car. Now, this is very similar for some of the symptoms, including uh, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, but space motion sickness very often also involves disorientation, uh, poor sensory motor control, and also effect on cognition. Why there is a space motion sickness? Well, there are different hypotheses about that. Uh, some hypotheses are mainly related to the uh, shifting fluid, the fact that some of the structure get compressed, as well as the fluid inside the vestibular organ gets different, inducing a different type of pressure, and therefore this might trigger um, motion sickness. But other uh, accounts seems to highlight more the role of um, sensory conflict as an onset and trigger for space motion sickness, meaning that our usual vestibular information about gravity is not longer there and because we are in microgravity. And therefore, the integration between online vestibular cues with vision, proprioception, and visceral cues is not longer convincing, is not longer the same, is not longer optimal, and these mind use motion sickness related symptoms. Space uh, motion um, sickness is not the only thing that astronauts seems to have report. There are also impairment in uh, sensory motor behavior. So here you can see uh, some of the people walking on the lunar surface. Now let's think for a second about walking. It's pretty easy for us to walk here on Earth. Once that we have learned about how to do that, it gets a, almost an implicit type of behavior that we can do without putting so much control. However, if the usual gravitational information is not longer there, look at the video, it's so difficult to walk in a different gravity environment. So balance is compromised, coordination is very poor, and locomotion is also impaired. But it's also been shown that astronauts reported um, proprioceptive 
deficits, uh, visual impairment, not only the blurring of vision, but also visual uh, illusion, and even the force that need to be used in order to interact with objects need to be adjusted. Now, people get better in these tasks. They get better in walking, they get better in using the right amount of force in order to interact with the object. It is not that it is not possible for our brain to adjust to a different gravitational environment, but it requires effort and resources. And if we consider sensory motor behavior as a low level type of behavior, then what happened at the level of cognition? So his cognition going to be affected by prolonged exposure to microgravity? And then what about the psychological and the psychosocial effects? And I do believe that researching into how sensory motor behavior and cognitive behavior are affected by altered gravity is really essential in order to ensure a good human performance during uh, space flight. And that's uh, what um, we do in my lab. And I would like to give you a little bit of um, an idea about the type of research that we are conducting here at Burbeck. Um, the idea that uh, we are following is that we should um, combine traditional space uh, research methods, such as uh, parabolic flight and centrifuge type of method with lab experiment because having simulated gravity in the lab allowed us to have uh, a different type of sample for our participant. We can test proper naive participant, as well as much more participant than the one that are traditionally allowed in a space flight method, meaning that we can also um, replicate our results uh, with a much more cost-effective approach. Um, so, as I mentioned, what we are doing is combining techniques from um, cognitive neuroscience, experimental psychology, and space methods in order to look at how altered gravity shape brain and behavior. And I'm going to present you today some of our experiment regarding perception, motor control, and decision making. In terms of perception, I would like to tell you about uh, a study that we have recently done that is focusing on pain perception. Now, why pain perception? Definitely not because I'm mean, uh, but pain is a very, very, very interesting sensory signal. Now, pain has an adaptive function. Having a clear representation of acute pain, pain on our skin is important for protecting our organism. We know that pain can shape exploitation, exploration behavior, and therefore is essential for adapting to the external environment. So we focus on pain perception and we wanted to see whether the uh, threshold for pain is changing in simulated gravity environment. So what we did? Well, we uh, attach our healthy participant, uh, healthy naive participant on a 3D tilting table and we place them passively in an upright posture or in a head down bed rest posture. Now in the upright posture, the vestibular system is, let's say aligned with the direction of uh, the terrestrial gravity. While in, we know that in a head down bed rest posture, the vestibular system is not really happy and it starts to signal information that are similar to the one that people might uh, experience in space. In head down bed rest, we have the head of participant that is six degrees below the feet. And they are going to stay in this uh, position for just a few minutes. So here I'm particularly interested in uh, changes in vestibular signaling rather than long-term changes in bodily physiology. So that's why our manipulation are not as long as traditional head down bed rest. Okay, so the subject is upright or in head down bed rest, counterbalance order of uh, conditions. And what we did was measuring the pain threshold on the fingertip. Now, we had a device that could exert a force in Newton on the fingertip. And we asked participants to tell us as soon as they start to feel pain. So the task is not to tolerate pain, but to tell us when the sensation, the mechanical sensation on the finger switch from being a mechanical sensation, a pressure, to a painful pressure. 
and they did so. So here in each, uh, each dot is a participant in the different conditions. And essentially what we found is that the pain threshold increased in head down bed rest uh, compared to the upright condition. So that means that participant report an analgesic effect when they were in the head down bed rest compared to the upright condition. We then wanted to replicate these results using a different type of um, simulation of gravity. Now, head down bed rest directly target signaling from the vestibular organ. So we wanted to use a different type of gravitational simulation that is now targeting gravity information uh, from vision. So what we did was using a virtual reality exposure. We blocked the head of our participant with a chin rest, which means that there is physiological habituation of the vestibular cues because the head could not move at all. And then we um, display, excuse me. And then we display in this um, uh, virtual reality setting, an environment that was an ambiguous environment with objects that were accelerating according to terrestrial or martial gravity. So essentially participants could not move at all their head, meaning that there is a downsize or down weightening of vestibular information, and they were bombarded with visual information about acceleration. And we measured the pain threshold during terrestrial virtual reality uh, condition or martial virtual reality gravity condition. And again, we found that there was an increase in pain threshold in the martial condition compared to the terrestrial condition showing an analgesic effect. So taking together these uh, results seems to suggest that when online vestibular information or when online visual information about gravity is conflicting with our internal model of gravity, there might be changes in pain perception. But what about motor responses? We wanted to look at how fast people are in responding to environmental stimuli, which are salient. And here we decided to use an auditory oddball task. In the auditory oddball task, you essentially present to participants hundreds of uh, sounds. Most of the sounds, 80% of sounds have exactly the same pitch and 20% of time, the sound has a different pitch, is a high pitch sound. It means that you are listening to hundreds of sounds and you're asked to press a button as soon as you can when uh, there is the target sound, the high pitch sound. Now, this is not a pure auditory task because if we look at neuroimaging data, we can clearly see that there are massive activation in our brain during this task, suggesting that is a task reflecting the fact that the brain is getting ready to respond to the environment. So we asked participants to perform the auditory oddball task in two conditions, upright and in head down bed rest. And we found that people were significantly slower in responding to uh, the oddball uh, stimulus when they were in head down bed rest compared to upright. Now they were not less accurate. They were still very accurate. The task is pretty easy actually, but they were slower in uh, providing the responses. And very interesting when we manipulate gravity via visual virtual reality um, exposure, we found exactly the same results. People were slower in responding to the oddball uh, stimulus when they were in the martial virtual reality environment compared to when they were in terrestrial uh, gravity virtual reality environment. But what about decision-making and high-level cognitive behavior? A couple of years ago, we have run an uh, implicit decision-making task in which we ask people to generate a series of uh, number and try to be as much random as they could in generating this series of number. Then we look at the randomness of the series that participants generated. And we found that interesting when subjects were in the head down bed rest condition, they were um, suboptimal in their behavior, meaning that their randomness was not longer present and they were generating routine responses rather than novel responses in a task in which you are explicitly asked to produce novel behavior. So overall, we found that there was a suboptimal decision-making when people were in head down bed rest compared to upright condition. 
and interesting, we have been recently looking at uh, risk-taking behavior. And again, we look at risk-taking behavior in upright or head down bed rest. Can I remind you that this type of um, manipulation are uh, short term, in meaning that participants are, are the orientation only for a few minutes, and they are targeted to altering the vestibular signaling. Okay, so what have we done here? We ask subject to take part in an implicit risk-taking behavior task in which they have a head-mounted display and they could see a balloon in, in front of them in the head-mounted display. And their task is to pump the balloon in order to gain money. So essentially you decide whether to pump or not the balloon. And every time that you can pump the balloon, you can get a little bit of money, virtual money. And your task is to try to gain um, a lot of money. It's all virtual. They were paid exactly the same amount, uh, but that's the idea of the task. Now, the issue is that uh, there was uh, the possibility that the balloon explodes and participant will lose completely their money. So here, essentially, you tell subject that uh, they need to pump the balloon in order to gain money, but the balloon can explode and is unpredictable when this is going to happen. And then you can look at the number of pumps that people who are doing, and you can use that as a proxy for risk-taking behavior. So it's an implicit task. It's not directly about risk, but you can have a measure of how uh, of the willingness of participant in taking risk. And we found that participants were significantly more inclined in taking risk when they were in head down bed rest orientation compared to upright. And finally, we have also recently shown that uh, in a cognitive flexibility task in which people are asked to quickly shift from one strategy to the other strategy, uh, cognitive flexibility is impaired during low uh, short exposure in head down bed rest compared to upright. So taking together these uh, set of results seems to suggest that lab simulated uh, alteration of gravity impact um, pain perception, uh, how fast people are responding to environmental stimuli. Decision-making is becoming suboptimal, but at the same time, people are more willing in taking risk and their cognitive flexibility, which is an essential function to interact with the external environment, is less accurate. So if we can observe this effect of um, altered gravity on brain and behavior, it might be very much possible that terrestrial gravity is such an important uh, prior for our behavior that might be indeed an absolute reference to shape our behavior. So it might be possible that the internal model of terrestrial gravity that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk is actually optimal for uh, behavioral adaptation on Earth. We have been looking at uh, the gravity advantage on uh, terrestrial gravity uh, environment, which means that how people are, um, whether people are better in detecting gravitational um, acceleration compared to other acceleration, and in particular, whether people are much more accurate in perceiving the speed of certain objects that are accelerating according to terrestrial gravity. Uh, when they are moving downwards compared to upwards. So you can see here that people are way better in detecting uh, objects that are moving downwards, the speed of objects that are moving downwards compared to objects that are moving upwards. And this is an evidence for this idea of having an implicit gravity prior. However, is this implicit gravity prior uh, fixed to terrestrial gravity? So again, we use virtual reality in order to investigate this question and we simulate Marshall acceleration. And we found that a very similar gravitational advantage for downwards motion um, trajectory was present, suggesting that the prior per se might actually change and might adjust to different gravitational environment. But if Gravity is a prior, and if we use the gravity prior to shape our behavior, can we look at how this is happening across different type of uh, cognitive function? 
We did that and we started looking at how the gravity prior shape biological motion. And the reason why we focus on biological motion is because biological motion implies the recognition of movement that are originated by a biological human agent. And only biological human agents are actually interacting against gravity, are interacting with gravity and can move against gravity. In other words, we can jump, as storms cannot really jump. So our ability to recognize biological motion is intrinsically related to our perception of gravity. What does it mean? It means that we have shown uh, to subject different uh, videos which are uh, dots that represent a body that is moving or a non-human agent that is moving. So essentially we had um, actor that were performing this movement and we were tracking the movement. And then we uh, scramble the different tracker that we use, which are these dots in order to create movement with the same trajectory, the same velocity, the same speed, but not in a human configuration. So here you can see someone walking. Let me try to show you it again. And here you can see exactly the same dot that has been um, scrambled in the screen, but keeping the same velocity, speed, and trajectory, but they are now in a non-human configuration. Another example is this movement here. It's a squat movement uh, made by a human being. And here is the computer version in which the dot has been moved uh, around in order to generate a stimulus that is not human. And we asked participants to detect whether these movements were human or not human, while they were in an upright orientation or when they were tilted. And here we just use a minor tilt of 45 degrees. And we found that the usual advantage that people have in detecting human versus non-human biological motion was not longer there when people were tilted. In other words, we are very good in detecting whether biological motion is present or not. We are much faster in detecting plausible human movement compared to random movement. But this advantage is not present when people were tilted of just 45 degree off of the vertical, putting in contrast the vestibular signaling to the inter in internal model of gravity. Another example is related to how the gravity prior shape position sense and proprioception. We know that uh, in upright orientation, people have a upwards bias in judging the location of their uh, body parts. So if you ask participants to judge whether the wrist is in a different orientation, they normally show an upwards bias in reporting this perceived orientation. But as soon as we tilted the subject off of the vertical, again, 45 degree tilt, this upward bias was not longer present. Once again, suggesting that when the vestibular signal is not congruent with an internal model of, of gravity, there may be a reshaping of uh, our perceptual experiences. And finally, we also wanted to look at uh, how people use the gravity prior for perceived weight. Now, weight, you may remember from school, is given by mass by gravity. And here we wanted to see whether weight perception is also influenced by gravity as the physical uh, weight. So we did a parabolic flight experiment in which we asked participants to judge how heavy they felt their head or their hand. And this was just very convenient to use their body parts because they were just attached to the participant and we could make judgment about that. So participants were uh, judging how heavy was their hand and their head. Uh, during the uh, 1.8G uh, phase, the 0G phase, and the 1.8G phase at the end of the parabola. And we found that the weight perception was systematically mirroring the amount of gravitational load that was present during the flight, suggesting that weight perception is not fixed to a uh, 1G idea of gravity, but can also uh, change in function of the, of the online gravitational information from the vestibular organ. Now, I just want to briefly mention that this is pretty cool in terms of uh, body weight, because we have this idea that our body weight is a stored semantic type of representation, but actually our results show that is not the case, is rather a dynamic representation that is taking account 
the amount of gravity perceived by our brain. And we have um, replicated these results using a human centrifuge in more participants. And I would like to also mention that uh, an interesting question related to the fact that terrestrial gravity by me uh, absolute reference is whether the gravity prior is innate. So what is the evolutionary aspect of the gravity prior? I show you in the slide before that is not necessarily fixed to terrestrial gravity, but here the question is whether it is innate or has been evolved because of our constant exposure to terrestrial gravity. Now, this is a very difficult uh, question to answer because uh, there are some ethical implications about that. Um, and we can definitely not test newborn babies uh, and see whether they have preferences for terrestrial gravity compared to martial gravity. But what we could do was to test uh, behavioral predisposition in newborn chicks. Now, newborn chicks are fantastic because their uh, sensory motor systems are fully developed, meaning that they are fully developed at birth. And what we can do is looking at behavioral predisposition and see whether they have predisposition, which means preferences, for uh, terrestrial gravity. Now, this is quite interesting because it has been shown that uh, behavioral predisposition are present in chicks for other uh, environmental feature, for instance, for some color, for some motion pattern. But here, what we wanted to investigate is whether chicks prefer downwards motion compared to upwards motion. And also whether they prefer accelerating object compared to linear um, motion object. So essentially, let me show you the video. We placed newborn chicks in an arena in which there were two different screens on the side, meaning that the chicks can see both screens at the same time, as you can see here. And um, on the screen, there was a ball that was uh, moving upwards or downwards. And then we look at uh, the predisposition of the chicks by approaching one stimulus on the other. When I say we look at the predisposition, means that we had a camera that was recording where the chicks was moving and with an artificial intelligence software, then we track the position of the chicks in the environment and we look at the latency of approaching uh, one or the other screen or um, uh, how long they have been uh, nearby the screen. Now the stimulus is this um, dark orange because apparently chicks love uh, that color and indeed they have predisposition uh, for that particular type of color. So here are our results showing that not only uh, they prefer a gravitational acceleration compared to linear motion, but they also seem to prefer approaching upwards moving stimuli compared to downward moving stimuli. And we interpret these data by the fact that they do have a representation of gravity, but they prefer to go towards objects that are moving against gravity. And those objects might be related to biological motion as explained in my previous slide. So to conclude, I think it's important, it's essential to focus uh, on the effect of altered gravity on human behavior, and it's particularly important to consider a neurocognitive framework for uh, these effects. Uh, we have recently um, published a, a paper in which we have been looking at the last 10 years of literature on um, the effect of altered gravity on brain and behavior, including space flight uh, papers, analog related papers, parabolic flight papers, and centrifuge papers. And the idea here was to look at um, which of these two different models might be mainly represented the effect of altered gravity on human behavior. So what we have done was identify three different uh, cognitive domain, the sensory um, motor domain, which include pathway for sensation, perception, motor coordination, and orientation, the cognitive domain, which includes pathways for um, decision making and high level uh, behavior. And finally, the social affective domain, which involves pathway for uh, social affective behavior as well as emotion. Now, these three different domains have been identified a priori based on anatomical um, structure, as well as the uh, effect of um, space flight on brain structure. And then we look at effect sizes produced by these changes induced by gravity on these three different domains. 
And it looked like from our analysis that actually a cascade framework in which the first thing that got impaired is the sensory motor domain seems to be the, the most valid one. So in this framework, it seems that alteration of vestibular gravitational signal seems to first impact the sensory motor domain, and then the impact on the sensory motor domain is cascading on cognition and social affective um, aspects. I told you that gravity is a sensory signal, but it's a unique sensory signal. It does not produce a phenomenological sensation as the phenomenological sensation that we are used to when we think about vision, touch, and auditory modalities is always on. We cannot really switch it off, as we can potentially do with other sensory modalities. And I hope that I convinced you that it's not just a background signal, but it's actually a signal that is constantly used by our brain in order to shape behavior here on Earth. The vestibular system can put, uh, sorry, the gravity can be potentially an absolute reference for human behavior and cognition. And perhaps not surprising, the vestibular system is fully myelinated at birth and is also fully functional before birth, suggesting that is really a key sensory modality for our behavior. So how can we ensure the success of future space flight? I think that more effort need to be put on um, flight preparation and training, as well as in-flight support. As we do have support for other physiological uh, systems, so I think it's time to think about how we can support uh, the human brain in order to ensure an accurate human performance. And on this note, I would like to finish my talk. I apologize if I talk way too much. Uh, I would be happy to take your questions. And before I finish, I would also like to thank my research collaborator, Maria Gallagher, Patrick Haggard, Matthew Longo, Timo Fritt, and Elisabetta Verstace, as well as the amazing people that are working with me in the Vestibular Neuroscience Lab at Birkbeck. And last but not least, uh, let me also mention that uh, the UNOSA Space for Women uh, mentee application is now open. I'm Absolutely proud to be one of the mentors. So please uh, get in touch if you have any questions and do not hesitate to apply if you're interested. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I probably stopped sharing the screen so then I can see you if that's okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Fair. That was really, really cool. Um, I have questions, but I, I'm gonna turn it first to the people that ask questions in the chat. Um, so the first person to ask a question I think was, um, Shirley Link. I'm sorry mm -hmm. if I'm really quick, name. really quick. We usually end the recording at the before the question session. Oh, okay. Let's do that. Okay. All right. 